All right, let's try this again. Okay. Yeah, let's try this again. You tell me when to go. We are live, actually. We are live, okay. okay. Welcome, Welcome to In Frame. Frame. We are trying very desperately to come to you live from the set of the Nature of the Beast trailer. We have been experiencing a number of technical difficulties. If you were able to join us a few moments ago when we started, we were discussing the Nature of the Beast promotional trailer being directed by my partner, Jamie Hall, who temporarily has stepped away to deal with some of the other technical difficulties and setup that we have going on. In the background, you can see the, uh, this used to be the high point pinch bar. Mm -hmm. What used to be the high point pinch, now being redressed, lit, and getting ready for club scenes that we would be shooting. Nature of the Beast is a story of a young girl who kind of loses a little bit of everything. Uh, her boyfriend dumps her, her parents are kind of tired of supporting her and helping her all the time, and she has issues of control where she feels as she's losing everything that she has to try more desperately to maintain control. And uh, as she does that, certain choices are faced along the way. One of the catalysts that comes into her life uh, to provoke these choices is a gentleman named Rob, who, out of place though he may be, comes into this club and meets Zep, a vampire, who very sleekly and subtly seduces him into her power and bites him. Uh, our lead girl, Ravana, then finds him, takes him back, and attempts to nurture him back to help and provide him. who she is, what is the nature of the beast that she is, the human. Uh, we also deal with the beast of the vampire. Unlike most vampire films, especially the modern ones, uh, Jamie Hall has decided that this will not be glittery vampires, this will not be your typical vampire movie, that he will be treated much more like an addict who is recovering from uh, drug use, making him very weak and dependent upon her in the, in the early stages of their relationship. Uh, do you have anything you want to add to it? Yeah, well, I mean, you said it. You said it within a mouthful, and I, I do plan on staying away from the glitz and glamour. You know, when you think vampires, I think Nosferatu. Um, right. You know, uh, not even. I don't really even think Bram Stokers. I think more of the Bela Lugosi kind of vampires. Uh, real. I mean, they are what they are. They're creatures. Are we still having trouble? Okay. <laughs> um, we, you know, I, I think mean, uh, vicious creatures of the night. So, that's well, they're they're creatures of of uh, primal instinct. It, their their whole reason to be is to feed, so yeah. that they can live, so that they can continue to feed, so they can continue. It's a cycle for them. Or well, a circle, well, excuse me. And with the aspect of you know wanting to make the character more of a um, junkie-like state, going through withdrawals and everything. It, you know, it shows what I call the metamorphosis mm -hmm. between humanity and immortal. The becoming. Yeah. Uh, the transitions between. So that's why I, I like to pay, that, that's why I want to pay more attention to the struggle with, you know, going through the DTs, going through withdrawals. And, uh, going away from everything else that everybody thinks that vampires are. Right. It's not about bestiality and necrophiliaism. Well, <laughs> by and large, the vampires aren't really what this story is. No, it's they, not. They are a catalyst for the story. They are a backdrop to the story. But the story is about a young girl. The story is about a young girl, and the story also is about her, her wanting con to control everything within her, within her own life. Right. Uh, and especially with, you know, the Robert character wanting to control him, wanting to control when he leaves, you know, how he feeds and so forth and so on. So, um, yeah, you're right. You know, the the vampireism is a catalyst to the, to the movie. It's it's right. not for say about vampires. There are vampires in it, and it, it has a very vampire-esque kind of feel to it. But it's not about the vampires. Right. 
Now, as we said earlier, and I don't know if that went across just because of the difficulties we're having today. I don't know if it's the weather or what it is, but <clears throat> I gave you this script about 10 months ago, and you sat and you read it. And I'm curious because you know my opinion. I wrote this script with my brother several years ago with the intent of selling it. He came, my brother ended up meeting a gentleman who had sold films to specific markets and kind of guided some of the story content and, and things that were in the script. Um, and, you know, I'm being paid to write a story, so I write what I'm asked to write. But the, the rights on this film to be bought and filmed by another company expire uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And I felt that even though the script itself isn't what I would want, the story that underlies the script is the kind of thing that your voice would could be loud with. So I'm curious, and you know, we've had controversy, we've had questions, we've had all kinds of things around this script. I'm curious what your take on the first read and, and the version I gave you. And the impression that made, the changes you want to make that you have been informing people of rewrites and things like that. What is it you, what is your vision of this story going to be? Well, my vision uh, of the story, and when you did give me the script, you told me, you, just, you said, you know, this is written for a separate market. This is not what I think, you know, full, full on what you, you know, I, I'm giving you the opportunity to change it as much as you want to. And if, recommend it. Yeah. If there's things in there that you might want to keep, there's things in there that you might want to throw away. My first impressions of the script, when I first read it, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to put some of this stuff on film and, and show it to an open market. But, you know, after, you know, sitting down talking with you and going over some things and really, you know, doing what directors are supposed to do, especially with anything that's written, and you want to go and look at the backgrounds. Of, you want to think of the backgrounds of the characters and the background of the story and the background of the instances that are going to happen within the movie. And you research them and you look at them. And you know you've given you've given me some guidance on guidance on it, and I've done some research on those and everything. Um, and I would wish that you know people that you know actors and actresses that read scripts like this would do the same. They give a little bit more education of what it's supposed to be like. There are some there <laughs> there were some things in there that was really hard for me as a person. Um, and I'm not going to give them away or say anything about them at right. this point, you know, just because I don't want to give any of the story away. But my vision for this film is to make it, uh, I want to keep it because that's one of the aspects that we're about. I want to keep some of the aspects about it. It's, it's no lie, it's no secret that this film does have some nudity in it. It does have some strong, strong sexual situations to it as well. And we, both of us as writers and directors, and filmmakers, we don't believe in just nudity to have nudity in a film. Right. If it's something that's supposed to be there, then we put it there. Um, I would love uh, to keep some of the things in there, but I know for the market that we're looking for, it, it, it just won't work. So, like you said, we are doing some revisions of it. Uh, I'm reading it every day. Uh, thinking about what I want to do and what my vision is for. As far as my vision, uh, how I want it to be seen is, is really hard for me to explain because the things that I think about as far as the way that I make films or, you know, and you can refer to this as well, the, the way that you make films and want them to be portrayed on screen is a vision. And it's, it's hard for me to actually project that vision into words. Um, you know, we were we were sitting around talking about things. You know, about uh, you know, especially with like Kubrick, Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick. He lights a he lights a movie every movie differently. Right. Um, Del Toro lights a movie very differently. Um, and I've gone back and I've looked at some of the you know some of the films that both of them uh, great directors have done, and go, man, some of these things would work in my film. Um, some of the visual aspects of it and I'll, I'll give it away a little bit I do want to start with you know we've discussed it many other times start with a brighter story you know where, where our color palettes are a lot brighter and as the film goes on and as the darker moments in the film come through 
that they do turn darker. Now that's that's a very Hitchcock. It is very style. Hitchcock uh, because rear uh, window, for exactly, instance, rear with window, the dimming as light. The story progressed, the lighting started exactly. to darken. Um, I do want to have aspects on certain actresses. Uh, Rachel, uh, with her playing the Ravana character, I, I want to have different aspects of her. You know, we have discussed it. Uh, upon length that we want to add more to the to the script. We want to add more meat about her. Right. Uh, you know, showing not just her crazy side and her um, deviant side, but showing more of a nature, of a compassionate nature. Mm -hmm. uh, building the character. Making uh, her relatable? Yes. And also, you know, bringing in more of other actors that we, did, that we don't have in the script as it is now bringing them more into it to tell more of a story about her and not just the light that people are seeing her in in this film, but kind of building a character from past experiences. Okay. Now, as you look at this character, well, let's, <clears throat> let's say the Ravana character first, the, mm -hmm. the lead lady of the film. What kind of character studies do you tell an actress to do? What, uh, I know you did some film research. Uh, you went up to Matt Martin at yeah. Black Lodge Video and told him, this is a character I have, and I need to research the type so that I can develop with my actress what it is I want. What do you feel may have been some of those key, key things? Well, some of the key things that I looked for, especially for Ravana character, I wanted damaged. I wanted uh, strong. Can you uh, answer this for me? I wanted a strong character. Uh, because she, Go ahead. she, she is a, she is a strong-willed character. Call it back for me. I also wanted to show her damage side, her her. I can't even say <laughs> it. I'm sorry, people. I have been up for days on end working on this thing, so bear with me. I'm looking away at other people. On we have set. a lot of distractions happening yeah. on set, as you can actually <laughs> see happening. Uh, it, this film, you know, it's very much housing. Um, she's she's. Man, this this chick can be a bitch. <laughs> I'm just gonna come out and say it. And so she, I mean, when you went to Matt and you told him this, I told him what? I wanted a, you know, I told him a couple of different things. I wanted damaged. I wanted, uh, I wanted strong. I wanted seductive, uh, because she's all of those characters rolled up in one. Because, you know, with being the person that she is, she uses herself to get what she wants. She uses her body, she uses her, you know, she is a very, you know, the, the character, the, the girl that we have playing her, Rachel. Rachel's a beautiful girl. Um, and she uses all those things to her advantages, you know, especially in this film. And um, Matt was like, you got to see Romeo is bleeding, you have to see The Last Seduction, you have to see The Craft. You know, of course, I'd already seen The Craft a, a million times. And um, it's funny he recommended that because honestly, as I wrote this, I kind of pictured uh, Feruza Balk. Yeah. And the character she had in that movie, where she's part of the good guys, as it were. Absolutely. At the beginning, and you see this descent into just sheer insanity, and that's that's a very good. Uh, right. It, it 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 was. And I had seen the movie, and it was funny because I didn't get the movie from him the, the night that I got a few of the films. And it was funny because when I got home, and I was getting really comfortable, I, I was getting my frame of mind of, to sit around and watch a few films and, and not watch the movie, but watch the characters within the film. And I turned the TV on, and I started searching through the guide, and there it was. There's the craft, you know. So I turned it on and was watching it for a meant little while. To be. Yeah, it meant to be. So I was sitting there watching it for a little while, and I, I just watched her. And, and believe it or not, um, after I watched the two films that Matt had recommended, I remembered another film that's one of my favorite films. It's American History X. And she was in that film she as was well. In that, yes. And uh, she was a complete bitch in that film. So I watched it as well. And I, I told, uh, you know, I told Rachel and a couple of the other female characters that I've asked to portray this, this character to do the same thing, to do the character researches and uh, watch some of these films and, and go to Matt Martin over at Black Lodge uh, and, at, you know, and ask him the same thing. Um, and it was funny because the night that we did everything with Rachel, she left and went up there and got those films. And uh, 
So, you know, with a female character in this film, you know, there's hardly any scenes in this film where the Ravonna character isn't going to be seen. She is, now granted this is the way the script stands now, but she is in 95%, 97% of the scenes. I don't think you have a scene that she's not a part of or she doesn't step into. Right. I mean, there are one or two scenes that start out, but then she comes into it. Yeah. And uh, so that's, you know, that's a that's, lot. That's a lot that's of a work. That's a lot to for carry her. for an actress. Yeah. Now, we will be doing rewrites. We may see different scene development. Yeah. But no matter what you do, no matter how much rewriting we do, the necessity of the story is Ravana's character. It is. It is. Now, I admit fully, and I told you this when I gave you the script, what we have written and because of the market we were asked to tailor it for, you're, you're reading a 14th or 15th draft. Yeah. And, and as you know, and as I have said many times, I'm actually very pissed at my computer crashes over the years because along the way, I've lost previous editions of the script. And there was one, I want to say it was draft nine or so, that I thought was actually, a, it, it started to be a strong story. And then the person we were marketed to said, I don't want this scene, I need scenes here, uh, I want you to add something. So, you know, the film opens as, as the script you have. It has three different beginnings. It, it does. It, I mean, there's a, there's a beginning, then there's a beginning, then there's a beginning. So we're seeing way too much of the same thing with no real character development. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to strip it down to the core story we're going to pull out the key characters, Beth, Robert, Zephyr, Ravana, and we're going to try to create a character that has more relatability that we can then follow through this journey. Hopefully this journey becomes an analogy to everybody. All right. of it, you know, not all of us are gonna make the choices she makes, but all of us at one point or another have made a bad decision. It's part of being human. This is a story of a girl who makes one bad decision, which takes her to the next bad decision, which takes her to the next bad decision. And pretty soon, she's gotten herself into a situation she can't just back out of. It's more, it, you know, I, I've termed it quicksand because the further that she goes and the more that she struggles through, the farther that she seeks down. Faster and fuller it pulls her down. Yeah, it, it, the story, you know, it's, you know, over the last couple of days, we, <laughs> You had mentioned controversy not too long ago about, you know, at the beginning. There has been some controversy around the script as it sets now um, because um, of some of the things that are in there and the way that, it, you know, the way that some of the things are portrayed in this film. But for, for me to give a full story and, and the vision that I have for this film to give that full story, um, I want that. I want those struggles, and I, and I want her to be seen for the person that she is, um, without, you know, cheapening it. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about controversy. Um, I was asked by an individual in in the area, who would want to see this movie? It's got controversy. It doesn't necessarily portray women in, in the the best of lights although it's not really about a woman so much as it's about all of us mm -hmm. in that regard. And that's a valid question. Who do you market a film like this to? And my immediate response was, well, do you suppose people wanted to see um, The Exorcist and some of the things that Linda Blair was asked to do in The Exorcist? Language, motion action, uh, actually some downright offensive material, mm -hmm. especially if you're a very religious-minded person. Right. Some of the things that happened in that film were absolutely off the chart. And in its day, it created massive controversy. Films have been about controversy from the start. You know, film was created, the, I think the first film project was in Leeds, England, at the kind of the birth of cinema. And one of the first things people did with it was create home movies. Right. Porn. Absolutely. And that has been carried through until this very day. Every time a new media comes along, 
the minute the internet opened up. It was everywhere. So controversy attracts attention. It's understanding the lines. Right. And for actors and actresses, when they get this script particularly, and you read it, there are moments where as you're reading it, you kind of wonder, just where is it going? Shooting style. How you shade something. How you create an angle for something. These are things that are, are filmmaker weapons. Mm -hmm. And you can make an audience believe just about anything you want. Right. If you can create it on screen right. So will we be losing the situations? And I'm not talking about, you know, a girl running around with no top. If that's a necessary scene, are we losing those situations or are we looking at how to execute them in an artistic style that will allow the illusion of what the script is demanding? Right. And, you know, and I've said it, I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it a hundred more times. You know, we've talked about it, you know, I've talked about it with other people um, that have had some concerns with it. You know, cinema today is amazing at some of the things that you can cheat and represent. But as film to me and cinema to me is also an expression, it, it's an expressive nature for directors and writers and um, editors and everything like that to express the way that they, they think that a film is supposed to be. Correct. Um, I'm very in the same running with some of those directors and writers. I believe that this is an art. It is an art. It is an escape for, for people, whether you be the director, the writer, or an actor in it. And I think sometimes if a writer is forced or a director's hand is forced of not showing certain things, then you're cheapening your film. And I'm not one of those people that are going to cheat my films because there's another person out there that says, I don't like it. Um, well, as I we, said, we, film, film has been controversy from the start. From the day that it was born, you know, to the you know, to now, there's always been, you know, there's always been controversy and, you know, we were talking about it not too long ago. There's a film that's been banned in like 13 countries, uh, uh, a Serbian film. A Serbian film. It's been banned in, in so many countries and everything. And I've watched, I haven't watched the film, but I have watched the trailer several times over and over again. And, you know, some of the shots and some of the angles, you know, even within a two minute trailer is just some of the best things that I've seen. But I personally wouldn't watch the film because of some of the content in it. Um, it's not something that I would want to open myself up to. But with this film, there are some things in there that I am going to take out, uh, you know, just because it's not a place for it. Right. It's, it's not something that we can market to another company, we can't market to a film festival, you know, we can't market at certain markets, you know, here or foreign, you know, to to get something, you know, to try to, you know, what's the word that I'm looking for as I'm trying to think? Um, well, obviously, we're shooting the trailer. Yeah. We're not even shooting the feature. Mm -hmm. So to be able to sell to an open market, you really kind of have to taper back yeah, and, and bring it down to a level that an investor can understand the story, can understand the, the vision and the style, but you don't want to put fear into them. Yeah, you don't you, want to scare you, them away. You don't want to something. scare them away and go, hey, this is, you know, this is what we're looking for. Of course, you know, with a trailer, you know, trailers are all pretty much rated G yeah. by the American Motion Pictures. By and large. By and large, they're, they're rated G. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to project some of the things that are in this in this script now because the script is going to go through a lot of revisions. Uh, and, you know, Cold Blood, it was a 25-page script, and we went through 15 revisions. And then even after that revision, I sent it off to Dwayne Craig and said, hey, make it a little bit more psychological, more scary. And when you got that, you ended up meeting actors and actresses after 15 drafts, 20 drafts, mm -hmm. you decided this character needed to be a woman now. Yeah. So, I mean, all along the way, changes take place. And, you know, as, as our philosophy in film, 
um, everything is constantly up for revision. Yeah, and uh, it's it's going to go through a facelift. But you know, going to your question, are there things that and situations that I'm going to take out of uh, take out of it? And there are going to be some situations and some things that I will take out of the script. Um, but like I've said, and I'll always say, I'm not going to take it out so much where it's going to cheapen where it's going to cheapen the script either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take a moment, since we got a small interruption, I'm going to take a moment. Um, we do have some extras showing up. I want people, once you've signed in, feel free to move about. Um, what we're doing here is a live broadcast. We understand that there's going to be background noise. Try to keep it down as much as possible, but please feel free to walk around, watch equipment, and watch your step, but please, mill about. Have fun. Um, I, I will never cheapen anything that I do as a director. If, if there's something that I feel that um, is too much for me to do, um, that might not be the script for me to do. It might be up to somebody else to do it. But artistically, I will never take something away from a film that I believe and I have passion about making. Um, Very respectable. I, I, I won't cheapen us as many of people have called us the dark duo. I don't know where that <laughs> came from. but. Um, I think it's because we made a movie at the same time Batman came out. Yeah, I, I just I won't cheapen it, and I don't deserve. I don't think it deserves to be done that way. I think it. I think when a writer writes something, it either makes sense or it doesn't. It either belongs there or it doesn't. And now, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there, and I will say, and you've heard me say it. I'm saying it to the public at large. As the author of this script, am I attached to some of what I write? In most circumstances, yes. This particular script has some, some things I don't necessarily care about, but by and large, I get very attached to my writing. Mm -hmm. It's why I do my best to write my own films and film my own works. But as a writer, if this was the Hollywood game, I wrote, I've been paid, I'm done. My voice is, my voice is no longer there. It becomes the director's project. Yeah. And you know, back on the controversy thing, there's a film made in 1978, starring George C. Scott, called Hardcore, which is a very, very raw film about a, a man whose daughter runs away, and she end, basically ends up in the uh, underworld of porn and, and sex trade, and he goes on the, the hunt for her. And this was made by a, a filmmaker in 78. The same filmmaker then made American Gigolo, mm -hmm. one of the biggest films in film history. He went a number of years, and, and there are other works in there, but he's gone at least a decade without having made a film. And he has a new film out called, did you say it was Canyon? Canyons. The Canyons. And what, what's the filmmaker's name? Pat? Stroud. Stroud? Yeah. Peter or Patrick? Peter's a writer, but I think it's Patrick. I, for, I forgive, uh, forgive me for not, uh, not remembering the actual director's name right now. But uh, his latest film, has possibly one of the more controversial things I've ever heard of in a film. He hired Lindsay Lohan to be the lead actress. And there are scenes where he had to hire porn stars to do these scenes with her. And this is a man who's known for pushing the envelope. But this is a Hollywood production. This is, you know, this is a name brand filmmaker. And he is understanding that you have to to push the envelope. You have to have controversy. You have to have conflict. Film without any kind of conflict is boring. Yeah. You know, that if you look at script writing books, script writing classes, all of them will tell you every single scene must have its conflict. And to make a film of this nature, no pun intended, and not acknowledge that dark side, not, not reference visually that side of her life which is such a massive part of her motivation um, any human's motivation we are so motivated by money and sex it's ridiculous as people to ignore that is to throw away all kinds of opportunity for conflict in your mm -hmm. scenes now again as we said how you shoot it how you light it you can do a lot without doing it yeah. so that's the art of film it is. I mean, it's the way you set up a shot. You know, not everybody's on. You know, 
as comfortable with being in this, you know, in a situation like that with a film crew in the in the room with them. And um, I respect that. Um, I respect actresses and actresses' <coughs> choices not to do certain things. Um, I've been told with this script many a time that this is a little more than what some of the actresses and actors I mean, would want to do. several people. And I I've still told people not yeah, to audition. I, I said that it, you know, that's that's a personal choice. Uh, I don't, I don't um, condemn you for it. But there again, we are only just shooting the trailer. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get through this first. Uh, trying to get through the trailer. I have eight different scenes to do for this trailer, and that sounds like a lot for a trailer. That's just today. Yeah. Um, no, I'm talking about completely. There's eight. Seen, di there's sorry, eight different did. scenes, I and I mean, I, yeah, with just one scene here today, I've got probably ten different angles. You know, reset up, set up, and 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 go again. So, I mean, you know, the controversy surrounds the basic the thing that the controversy is surrounding now is just the script within itself. Right. Um, there hasn't been some controversy about the trailer, but that, you know, uh, I say to people that that like to start controversy and um, uh, I'm going to go back to some of my old self, uh, the people that like to start controversy and drama over things that they have no ideas of what they're talking about or speaking, in my opinion, is childish and um, uncalled for. Uh, this is supposed to be a community that we're tied in. This is a community that we all want to work with one another and help one another in. And for people to start controversy over something that hasn't been read is, in my opinion, stupid. Well, I don't want to get into the no. all of that. Controversy aside, there is some valid reason to some of the people's opinions and, and concerns. That's mm -hmm. the word I'm looking for. There are very valid concerns. Oh, no, I absolutely um, agree. And, and one of the things we have had trouble with is getting people, you know, we give them the script. We give them portions of the script, or they they spend five minutes in a room with me, and I can't shut up, so I explain the script. But one of the things we have been constant about is that this is not the script we will shoot. No. Mm -mm. So, and and as I said, there are a few actresses I've said, you know what, this time maybe not. Um, there are a few actresses that some of the other coaches in town have said, you know what, this one maybe not, and and that's not an invalid thing. Um, we are doing our best to keep everything mature oriented. Mm -hmm. um, we, we recognize that the film itself is a very hard NC-17. The rating on that will probably not change much, if at all, with rewrites. Um, the quality of the story will, will of course, increase. But right. uh, the, the overall content and things like that will only change so much. Um, Facing controversy as a filmmaker can do one of two things. It can wear you down and break you, or it can build you up and make you stronger. And I think that, you know, any time a filmmaker face, faces controversy, judgment, jealousy from others, whatever it might be, the best thing for that filmmaker to do is his film. Mm -hmm. And let it speak for itself. Uh, when I made Morning Ritual, 12 years ago, almost to the date now. I spent a lot of time standing in the back of crowds. I didn't step out and say, hey, you know, this is my movie, this is my movie. Because I felt the movie should say what it says by, on its own. And if somebody want, might have questions, want to talk to me about it, I'm more than willing. But I kind of wanted the piece to be the introduction. I didn't want them to meet me. You know, I spent most of my life being not the normal. There was abuse in high school and class. You know, yeah. I, was, I was that kid that got picked on all the time. And uh, it just seemed the best thing for me to do was not let them meet what they thought they were meeting when they see me, that judge a book by the cover thing, but to let them sit down and see the art that I can create and then let them meet me and see how that changes the perception. So, controversy, stress, you know, whatever it might be, the best thing for you to do, and as you have done, is to focus. Oh, yeah. And make this the best 
product, you are capable of making it in the time you have with the equipment and the people that you have to make it. I mean, it doesn't bother me. I mean, at one point, I can't, I can't, well, I can't really say it doesn't bother me. At one point it did, but I've had, you know, I've had many of phone calls and many of text messages and emails and it's like, do what you do because we know what you're about. We know how that you want to portray a film and we know who you are. So uh, with with those things being said by several different people, it, it has made me feel better. And I, I am one of those people that rise above things. Um, I'm very steadfast. And, and ultimately, what will matter, as I said, the project, but it's about the actors. It's about the actresses. It's about the projects. It's not about us. It's not about the ego. It's not about being defensive or accusational or pointing fingers or anything. You know, drama's going to happen. No. Drama happens with any two people. You know, several people create their own drama for themselves. Our job as filmmakers is to put drama in front of the camera mm -hmm. and to avoid it behind the camera. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that will fly around any film community or any other contained community. In our case, the Memphis film community. What the hell? <laughs> it's the heat. And, uh, those are going to happen. Whether someone says something and then that phone conversation's down the line to the fifth or sixth person that now says, this was said, it's probably not true. It's certainly not accurate. And there's really very few ways we can never know the real truth. So ultimately, it comes down to the actors in films in this town. Mm -hmm. All of us in town, whether you come to Rising Fires, Inner Fire, Acting Class, whether you go to Daniel Martin's uh, Master uh, acting, acting Class, or whether you go to Forrest Pruitt and Tim Sherrod's Indie Acting Studios, as long as you are working, that's what matters. And as you know, I've said to many people, I don't care where you go. And I actually recommend you try different ones at different times because you will never know, you know, I teach different than Forrest. Forrest teaches different than you. You teach different than Daniel. Daniel teaches different than me. It's, you know, we all have a style. We all have a language. And different people at different times will respond to that differently. So please, you know, visit all your, all your acting classes in town as much as possible. And I, you know, in a, one of the poorest cities in the country, I realize it's not always possible. Yeah. But get out there. Learn from different people. Work with different people. You know, there are people that have a certain loyalty, and I fully respect loyalty. But if you have a really good actor that's loyal to our class, and you are loyal to Daniel Martin or Forrest Pruitt, you may not get a chance to work with that actor mm -hmm. until and possibly you are on a set together. Actors should know each other. It helps build a natural chemistry. It's a network. And, and it is a network. And as acting coaches, as acting teachers, as filmmakers, our job is to make sure that those actors are networking. Yeah. And, you know, I have I have a gentleman who I've done private classes with, Alex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at this moment in time, I doubt he's watching. Um, and if he is, Alex, listen to me. He does not have a Facebook account. He does not come out to the film mixers. He does not attend many, if any, of the actual acting classes anymore for different reasons of his own, many of which had to do with travel for a while. But he wants to work. And having worked with him, I know that he has a passion. And with proper direction and communication, he can find a role within himself. He can find a character. He's actually pretty decent at it. But no one knows it. Right. So how does he get work? How does he stay informed? You know, when I first started in this, in Memphis 12 years ago, I heard about most of the projects that were going on in town through word of mouth, through people that knew I was on the edges of the community. So they'd say, hey, do you know about this? Do you know about this? Do you know this person? And that helps you create a physical network. And you know, nowadays we're all about the smartphone, Facebook, and all this virtual connection. And that's a wonderful tool. But nothing, especially for an actor, nothing beats this. Yeah. Face-to-face -face interaction with your fellow actor, your fellow actor coaches, and getting yourself out on sets. Um, being an extra. You know, we've got a handful of people here right now and, and more coming. Being an extra. 
showing that you have the willingness to come out, to be on a set, to sit there sometimes for eight and ten hours with very little actually happening. Very often all they're getting is pizza or hamburgers if they're that lucky. And you come out and you show that kind of support. That filmmaker should take note of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we do. Yeah. You know, most of the people we work with are people that have come out to our sets time and time again because they believe in us. And those are the people that we call first. Mm -hmm. Those are the people we notify first. Those are the people that when another filmmaker says, hey, do you know anybody? Those are the first names we're given because we have seen that they come out and they support. I just noticed one or two gentlemen walk in here and I saw them on the shoot last week with uh, Chad Allen Barton and Piano, Piano Man. Pictures. And that was a scene much like today's weather gray, cold, rainy, and they were out there from 8 o'clock in the morning until probably 4 o'clock in the afternoon or later, and these people sat there, and they did what they needed to do over and over and over, and none of them are going to get glory, No. none of them are playing a big role, but they're support people, but by showing that support, one or two of them has attracted my attention. Ron Gephardt, local actor on stage, local teacher at times. I posted a comment about extra work. He posted underneath of it, agreeing with my comment and saying that it is very important for actors to do this type of thing, that he tells his actors that, and that he supported the actors of his that listened. And in the process of his comment, he actually put in print the actors' names that he said came out and sat in the rain for eight hours. And I immediately grabbed a pen and a piece of paper. And I wrote those names down because this is a man in town we can all respect and he is saying these are people we can work with. So we will look into these people. And that's the kind of thing we bring right. when, when we have a set. We, we like to interact with our people. We have often told people 24-7, our phones are on all the time, ringers are on all the time, although mine has been having issues lately. I do my best to answer my phone no matter the time. And if it's a film community question, I will give you my time. Jamie will give you his time. Now, we are starting to get down to the wire. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of cameras set, a couple of lights set, extras <laughs> coming in. It's now uh, about 3 o'clock. You're going to have the body of your people arriving in about half an hour. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and yeah, start I was gonna, interacting with your cast? I was going to bring... Uh Nick McLean over, who okay. is going to be the Robert character, and let him get out there a little bit, and let you ask him a few questions, and I'm going to excuse myself. You go do that, de-stress, and start talking to your extras. Nick, can you mind joining us? Can, can you call the top number in my recent calls? I don't know who it is, but they called me. Nick McLean. Nice to see you. Hey. Yeah. We, uh, we last worked together on Cold Blooded. I was AD, you were second AD. Yep. Um, was that your first film project? That was my second one. Second film. Second one. So, from that to this. Now, again, we mentioned Christian Walker had this role, um, and I think he's working on moving out of town, so he had to back out because he right. knew, you know, with our shooting schedule, he didn't know if he'd actually be here. Mm -hmm. So this role came to you sort of last minute. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you came over to, to my house where we hold our, our product, uh, production office, and we did some scene run-throughs. Jamie and I blocked out five hours, and we were done with you in an hour and a half. <laughs> so what is your take on the character? And we, we have discussed the number of changes the script will have, but right. your take on the character... Why did you say yes? What was the interest? I mean, I know you support Jamie and probably would have done anything he asked you. Yeah, um, probably. But, but, well, but this anything. character, why this character? What is it that appeals about this character? Um, just the, the whole transformation that he goes through. Uh, it just seemed like uh, something that would be... Uh, it, it was... I don't really know how to put it into words, but... Is it the challenge? Um... Not so much the challenge. I just really like the way the character changed over the, the course of the story. Uh, okay, so... Uh, but a prob probably more 
more so just the whole story in general. Uh, the the way that he is just just from going from I don't you know I don't I'm just kind of here I don't really know where I'm at and then all of a sudden getting sucked into it you know uh, didn't have a choice in the matter it's uh, it's kind of forced on him mm -hmm. and then to go through the struggle that he goes through afterwards not knowing what's going on where he's at why he's there uh, just that whole kind of mystery I guess around right kind of that's kind of what now have you actually read the whole script all the way up until the like the I didn't want to ruin the ending because to for for the character he doesn't know where he's at and he doesn't know where he's going so I didn't want to go to that place before nice it was time to go there it's an interesting so choice to, as an actor yeah just to give it that you know I still for me as a person I don't know where he's going and him as a character he doesn't know where he's going either so now, if you were doing the full feature mm -hmm. Would you have maintained that? Yeah, I've I've thought Until about it. Scenes came along. Yeah, I thought about that too, and I, and uh, just to keep that, to try and put myself into that character, uh, to have that mystery there and to not know, because if you know, then it might right. change up some of the now, ways that you were. Often films are not filmed in sequence. Right. So right. you may face knowing. Yeah. Before you want to know. Yeah. Um, and you will experience a little bit of that in here today because we will be filming one scene, two scenes, three scenes, and then coming back to us, you know what I'm saying? Right. So there will be moments where you may have more information than you do presently. Yeah. Um, what's it like? I mean, you've known Jamie how long? Um, it's been three years now. Three four, years? Three years. How was it? Three or four years. How was the ride watching him decide to go into film, to, to dedicate to film, to see the the birth, the gestation, the creation of Cold Blooded, the reaction that came from Cold Blooded and continues to come, honestly. Yeah. Um, and now jumping into you know full feature direction. Well, I mean that's kind of how I'm met Jamie. Well, I guess I met him before that, but we never really talked or anything like that. We just knew each other. Uh, but as far as us becoming friends, it was because of Cold Blooded. My friend, Blake, who was uh, originally when he was you know, still trying to finish the script and, and put stuff together, and it was just kind of an idea of something he really wanted to do, but he hadn't taken that next step yet, uh, was going to play a role in the movie. And he let me read the script. And I was like, this is really cool. Uh, sounds like something that would be fun. And he said, well, he's looking for more people to be in it. And he doesn't really know anybody yet. So <laughs> From that yeah, to I mean, second it AD. Was, yeah, it was. On, on that same project. Yeah. That's a leap. Yeah. And, you know, as first AD, I have to say, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Um, are you schooled in this? Do you use your backing ground Not at all. Or is this not at all? Not at all. None whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Just... Um, <laughs> You know, just the confidence of Jamie. Uh, he makes you feel like you're helping, even if I wasn't. I don't know. You, you know, oh, you it's, were. Uh, Trust us. You, you did. I just kind of went in. You know, what would I do in this position if I was Jamie? What would I want me to do? You know. So that's kind of where I took it. And and Jamie's very good about communicating what he wants. Yeah. Um. And you, you're a very intelligent man. You listen well. Uh, I've done minor work with you. I think I even directed you not directed you as such, but I think I gave you a, a scene analysis, as it were, um, at Forrest's class one night when you got up on stage and performed a scene for him there. Yep. Um, so I've seen you do a little bit of work, and, and there is a, a certain naturalness that you have. It's actually one of the things um, for me that is often a little bit more difficult to teach an actor to be fully natural. Um, a lot of people have a tendency to get a script and kind of rush through their dialogue. Like okay. They're trying to spit it out fast. And I spend a lot of time telling them, you know, bring the breath, bring yeah. the pause. Because when a person speaks, as you can hear with me, you have pauses, you have lulls, you have rises. Mm -hmm. And you don't always know the exact word you want to choose. So sometimes you even have the stammer or the, or the just 
before you go back. Right. And those are very natural human things. And when you grab a script and you read, people have a tendency to read. I noticed with you very quickly that you don't read. You, you speak. And you may be speaking while looking at paper. You may be speaking while not looking at paper. But I've had conversations with you, much like this one, just us at a table. And it's the same comfortable feeling that you are delivering in your character. And, you know, all of us as actors will bring so much of ourself to any role. How do you intend or plan on keeping Robert separate from who you are as a person? Um, I really haven't thought about it, you know. I, I kind of just went through, when I was reading through the script, uh, I really just transported myself, really. I don't, I don't kind of, I don't try to relate it back to what would I do if I was that character. I just put myself in that character's position and did you, uh, become that character. You did know? you use any scene studies or any character references? Was there any, uh, any particular film role that you kind of thought, you know, kind of reminds me of this character a little bit? Yeah, uh, Misery. That was, I mean, that's the only one I could think Interesting of. Interesting choice. Uh, and you're, you're, you, know, you mean uh, James Conn? He, yeah, he's uh, he's stuck. Um, kind of have that, that helpless feeling. Uh, nobody's around that can help him. Uh, of course, you know, he uh, he had lots of opportunities to try and escape and everything. But uh, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking, you know, the whole time I was reading through the script. Uh, it kind of feels like that same okay. helplessness, you know? Interesting. So, as, as we prepare to actually move forward and, and film these scenes, are you one of those actors that gets nervous? Christine, mm -hmm. see some people she knows. She comes in, she moves across the dance floor, speaks to the DJ, off to the side she sees her boyfriend, right. ex-boyfriend now. So immediately there's a defensive posture and an anger. She marches over to him and unleashes. He is a complete ass to her. That's my character. Mm -hmm. He's a complete ass to her. Walks away. She turns and watches him go and immediately sees your character sitting there somewhat out of place, potentially vulnerable, and a target for her, not as a weapon, or not as a personal desire but as a useful potential weapon right. that she can use against her now ex-boyfriend to get even. So she's got to go through all of this range of emotion as a new young actress, all in one day, all through one scene, yeah. really. And, yeah. we, and we aren't filming completely sequential, but it is, it's going to be, for her, back and forth. Yeah. And that can, be, that can take a toll on an actor or an actress. Mm -hmm. So I support... I, I appreciate you being in the scene where they're showing her the support that you were showing in the rehearsals. You, uh, you were very natural and in the character, and you made the scene work without taking the scene over. Because the scene really is hers mm -hmm. for the moment. Definitely. And then, of course, there's the big moment where Zephyr, our vampirus, walks into this club. And it's almost immediate. You know, Ravana sits down, you say hello, and you see Zephyr. Right. And everybody in the room sees Zephyr. She moves across that floor with grace, and she takes you just right out of Ravana's hands. And that leads to, you know, later the event that happens to your character. This is going to be very difficult for Rachel. And, and, difficult on the Ravana character, but it's going to be difficult for her to show all of this. So I, I definitely appreciate you, you uh, being a strong supporter of Jamie's, being a strong supporter of the film, being a strong supporter of our fellow actors, and, and really letting this scene flow natural. Yeah. And I look forward to the work. I'm going to go ahead and let you 
hop out of here and get going, and I'm going to see who else I got on here that I can make a target out of. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Enjoy the day. We'll uh, we'll get going here. I don't know what time it is right now, but 325. All right. Just about a half an hour, a little bit over. We'll be wrapping up the show, and Jamie will be taking over, and we'll be going full throttle. So I look forward to it. Thank cool. you. Cool. I'll see you Thank later. Thank you, Nick. I'd actually like to call uh, Spencer. Chevalier. He's going to pronounce this for you. Uh, go ahead. Chevalier. Chevalier, okay. Spencer is the director, oh, excuse me, the uh, editor on Jamie's first film. I was about to say, I got promoted. <laughs> not yet, but we're not above it. I'm go ahead and grab the mic. Um, you are the, direct, or the editor on Cold Blood for Jamie. Right. Um, I suspect you will probably be working on this as well. Uh, I will be working on it completely. Absolutely wonderful to hear. Um, now, you are an editor. Right. Camera operator. Mm -hmm. I know there's more. Why don't you tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself? Um, well, <laughs> I probably have more experience with editing and camera work, but um, I've done a little bit directing here and there, just make it a little short films, mm -hmm. especially when I was in class, but um, I hadn't been in the uh, film industry real long, just maybe two and a half years, and um, I feel like I've gotten a lot of praise, you know, for what well, you, I've done. You did, you did a very, very good job mm -hmm. on Coldplay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you started out as lead cinematographer. Mm-hmm. Oh. Hold on one moment. That's all right. Hey, uh, Sarah, can you answer this? It's our lead actress calling. Um, pardon me. Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Um, you did an excellent job mm -hmm. on Cold Blooded. You came into it initially as lead cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, Jamie was still subject to his own nerves pretty significantly. <laughs> and, that's uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> and, and despite every desire he had to not direct from behind the camera, he couldn't let it go. Yeah. This time, he's not touching the camera. Oh, well, this we'll is see. Too big. <laughs> uh, no, we, we've, got, we've got Kent Hampson doing a majority of our, our shooting, and uh, you and I will be getting some B-roll here and there. Right, right. But uh, between you, me, and Kent, we're not going to let Jamie have a camera. No, we need we need to keep him away from him. And, and it's not that he isn't good. Exactly, just, he needs to do is, do this, what he needs to do. This is an opportunity for him to really focus on his direction skills. Right, right. Um, do you yourself, having done some direction, is that a thing you want to take on in the future? Do you want to direct your own work? Uh, be quite honest. I mean, I, I, I do. I do like some aspects of directing, you know, because there's something about controlling what you're doing in the film, especially when you're getting all the way down to the editing part, because you know what to expect, you know how you want to do it, mm -hmm. okay, and especially when you have special effects involved, right? You know, because then you say, okay, we need to film it this way so that I can make this special effect happen, you know, uh, so it does make it easier. And that way, when you get to the post-production part, it's it's like it's a no-brainer. You've got all you need. Right. You know, you, you understand how it's going to work. And there's no one to blame uh, but yeah, yourself. Yeah, no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Nobody to blame but yourself. Uh, but even with that being said, um, as much as I do like that kind of control, you, it's especially when you get further into the film industry, you can't do it all. Right. You know, and right. I think that's going to be the biggest ordeal. And if I had to have a choice which route I'd want to go, uh, as much as I do like the directing part of it, I, I will kind of more geared towards uh, editing. That's because, music to our ears. Because it's something I love to do. Uh, there's there's just something, and this this could be said in all forms of art, but there's something about taking a piece of work, putting it together, and watching it happen. It's like what making magic happen, you know. And and I understand it. Um, I have done some editing myself, minor. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm by no means an editor. Um, I find it tedious. I, it I, can be. I, I thrive off of the human interaction mm -hmm. on helping people find something inside of themselves that they can bring to a character. Mm -hmm. And then I 
help them do it in the scene. That's mm -hmm. my strong point. That's my happy place. Right. As it were. And it, it, it definitely can be. Now, to me, though, like, programming's tedious, you know, but. Anything with a computer um, is tedious to me. But when it comes to editing, um, I mean, the more that you uh, do it and the more that you try to make different things happen that don't naturally happen, you know, and, and try to figure out how to do something like, like, how do you make this gunfire without actually firing it? Right. Well, you know, for example, or uh, like in Cold Blooded, some of the shots that we did, you know, with the, uh, uh, with like uh, when we were filming from below mm -hmm. uh, the actors, when one of the actors was leaning over, yelling at the other one in the chair, and uh, making it, making the film work, work look like that. You had a slide of the shot come down, right, another right. slide of the shot, and another slide of the shot. It really adds to the intensity of the film, you know. And, and, uh, and that's, you know, Craig Brewer, um, mm -hmm. who all of us know. I was fortunate that my first film was executive produced by him. And mm -hmm. we had many a conversation about filmmaking and things like that. And he taught me a lot. Um, and he, he gave me a few set philosophy or, or, or filmmaker philosophy points. One that stuck with me was at least once do everything write it direct it edit it because when you write a story you're done mm -hmm. as a writer that goes to a director the director now tells that story his way right and he figures out everything the writer didn't do right that was needed and then you give that to an editor and the editor's job is to tell that story according to the director's wishes. But the other thing the editor does is discover everything the director did wrong. Right. <laughs> so you write something, then you direct it and you figure out your mistakes. Then you edit it and you figure out your mistakes as a director. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a good process It's, it's just learning. weeding everything out and smoothing um, the whole transition. The fact that you are an editor is music to my ears personally. I know Jamie's and probably several other people out in the film community. I know mm -hmm. that you're working on uh, Christmas Ride right. for Karen Francis. Right. Um, there are not enough editors, active, available editors, mm -hmm. in this town. And, you know, in our experience, finding someone who can dedicate the time and the effort that will have the passion mm -hmm. that you want put towards your And that's, that's very important with the editing part, too. And yeah. that, that's what I mean. You know, I'm Jamie and I both, and probably every filmmaker out there, yeah. very passionate about their work. And we have to turn that over to, in my case anyway, I have to turn that over to someone for editing. Absolutely. Most of the time I work with Marcus Ken Hampson. Um, he's my roommate, so my wife, him, and I can sit there. We can discuss things. Oh, it makes it easy. And watch them happen. So it's in-house, mm -hmm. which is fantastic for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I know Marcus is a great editor, too, by the way. He's, he's a very good editor, but it's not what he wants. He does it because we don't have an editor. And I tell everybody that you're, on, that you're one of our editors, and you are more actually freelance. You are not a Rising Fire employee, but I can't imagine not having you on our sets. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine not having your knowledge, if nothing else, at our disposal. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, and I don't know if it was for some of Cold Blooded or some of The Bag, which I had directed mm -hmm. around the same time, but if I remember correctly, there was a conversation between you and Kent mm -hmm. where you were discussing editing. Oh, yeah. And you were, you were giving each other tricks about editing. Right. Um, <laughs> I discussed a lot with Kent, and, actually. And that made him a better editor, mm -hmm. and in some ways maybe even helped you make different choices mm -hmm. as you were editing Cold Blood. It, it did. It actually impacted that a little bit, you know, and uh, I, I talk a lot with, uh, with with Kent, you know, in regards to editing uh, for different things that I'm, because <laughs> still I am, as much praise as I've gotten from different people, especially my old film teacher, Harry Dock from Southwest right. Tennessee Community College. Um, both him and, uh, Harry Dock and Kent are a big inspiration on the, my editing. They help me a lot if I uh, need the help, you know, and uh, trying to fine tune different things. Right. Like the main editing part, I, can't, I got down packed, but uh, every once in a while there's something new that you want to do, 
and you want to figure out how to do it. And um, although you can browse the internet all day and find different tricks and technique, there's there's nothing better that you can get than somebody that you personally know to explain to you how they've done it. Nice. You know, uh, because there's there's everybody's got their own technique. Right. You now, know. As an editor, you you want projects. Right. Absolutely. So Jamie and I need to get moving. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because the, you guys are the number one group I will help out of anyone. I appreciate it. You know, Rise of Fire, so. Rise of Fire is on the top of my list. Well, you we know, appreciate you know, that. Yeah. Uh, and to guarantee you, you will be a part of everything we do for many, many years. I have. I, oh, I, 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 I right plan on I plan on being there as much as I can. Believe right. me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Laz. I'll let you go out there and get us some more publicity stills. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to see who else I can hunt down over here. Let's see who. I appreciate it, Spencer. Thank you. All right. Well, we've got a, a room full of people slowly filling up. Did you want to jump in again? No, I just didn't want you to be over here by yourself while you're uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I see a couple of our actresses and actors are now showing up. Yep. It looks as though we yeah, have our primary here. cast. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Nature of the Beast promo trailer shoot right here. Um, we've got a couple of our actors and actresses, our, of our leads actually on, on set now. I'm going to give them a few moments to do their thing, and I think Jamie might have swiped the one I was going to try to call over here. I think he went to take um, a moment. Alexandra Wolf, a young lady actress model in the community, will be playing the role of Zephyr. And, uh, you know, Jamie and I started out this broadcast, hopefully it made it to our audience with, through all the difficulty, um, talking about how we cast three different women in this role, right? and they all had to pull out because they, after getting cast, yeah. became pregnant. Uh. We then also had a role, uh, an actress cast for the role of Zephyr, who also informed us she was pregnant. So kind of in, in the Rising Fire Productions office, this has kind of become the get you pregnant film. Um, <laughs> right Glad down to when Christian, <laughs> well, Christian Walker called us and told us he had to pull out and both, you know, Jamie and I both were like, is he pregnant too? Um, just because it had gotten that ridiculous. There's a lot of jokes in there. There are um, numerous jokes. Um, try to keep it family friendly. Yeah. Um, but I think we got well, one I think, now we, I think we have one of our actresses, but what I wanted to get at was you. Rachel, Alexandra, everybody's been pulled in last minute. I am the only person cast in this film that's been constant. And that only happened because I said to Jamie, I'd love to play this role because it's a complete masturbatory fantasy for me. I get to play a wash, an over the hill, not yet rock star. Yeah. Um, and that, that's just gonna be a blast for me. But we have gone through seven, eight, nine people mm -hmm. for two roles. And it has been unwieldy to make this all happen. And then we're calling up people last minute. Take on a roll. Take on a roll. And that had a lot to do with why Jamie redid the, the trailer a little bit so that our actors and actresses weren't coming in with five days of preparation trying to deliver paragraphs. Yeah. Or um, one-liners. And you know, we, we <laughs> cut it down to one-liners and, and one or two-liners to make it do it. So... I'm going to ask you to, to step yeah, on out of here, here, and I'm going to call up Rachel. All right. Rachel, if you want to come on over for a minute. How's it going? I'm doing well. Hey, Bambi. Hello. This is Bambi Lang, one of our production <laughs> assistants. Hello. Thank you. This is, and I'm going to ask you to pronounce your last name properly. This is Rachel... Eamon. Eamon. See, I got it wrong every time. <laughs> um, go ahead and take the mic if you want. Oh, okay, sure. Now, I've known you for a little while. You've come to me for some solo classes. You are a belly dancer in the area with your own troupe, Nava Sanctum, so you're used to performing in front of people. You came to me maybe a year ago to talk about things you could do to help develop character through physical expression mm -hmm. to use in your dance. Right. Now you're sitting on a set. <laughs> you got the phone call to come on this set, what, 10 days ago? Something there like about? That, yeah. And I have to admit, I was a little surprised at how anxious you were. Through our discussions in our private classes, I got the impression you were really trying to focus on developing your dance performance. Mm -hmm. So 
my question will be a, a multiple question here. What changed? And how will this still help you with your dance and things like that? Uh, well, I'd say what changed was uh, being willing to try something new. And uh, this, it's an exciting thing. Um, and I'll say as far as dance, I think it's already been helping because I'm already thinking uh, more into if it's a lyric song I'm thinking more uh, the if I was a character in the song what would that be portraying character wise okay. so I'm, I'm, my gears are already turning in different ways excellent now we before you arrived we commented on how Jamie and I blocked out a five-hour period of time for you to come over to, to our to my place where our offices are work with me a little bit on our scene bring in Nick work on that scene uh, the intention was to bring in Roz as well to work on the bet scene, which unfortunately weather's going to prevent us from even shooting. What is your take on the character, and what, in in Jamie's direction, what has helped you the most? And have you done any character studies in film? And if so, what characters did you look at? Um, I, th I guess the character Ravana is uh, she's troubled damaged, um, she's uh, manipulative and provocative, and um, so my character studies that I did, I looked into uh, The Craft, okay. which you suggested, yes. and Girl Interrupted, and um, those two were pretty interesting. I think The Craft was really good. She played a good crazy. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's not the deepest of movies, mm -hmm. but the arc that Feruza Balk's character mm -hmm. follows, mm -hmm. where you you know she's troubled, but you're not turned off to her as a character. Mm -hmm. And then you follow that, and you see the troubled youth become wounded. Mm -hmm. You see the wound become anguish. You see the anguish become just this tyrannical attack mm -hmm. on everything around her. Do you feel that that's a similar, that you will use that similarly in this character? That the arc that she is going through kind of parallels that in a lot of ways? Mm, yeah, there's definitely a decline there in, in both. Um, I, I really, I just, I liked how uh, crazy she got towards the end. Um, so I, I think that was probably my favorite. Girl Interrupted was pretty good too. Um, now, you, you bring that up. You were at our class last Monday and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. And the scene we gave you was from Girl Interrupted. Mm -hmm. Did seeing, now you played the doctor in the scene, mm -hmm. and Audrey of course played, uh, boy I just blanked out we, completely. Uh, Susanna. Susanna, thank you. <laughs> now obviously Susanna is closer to the Rivana character than the doctor is. Mm -hmm. But in playing the scene and seeing someone else not on screen, but right in front of you, in a scene with you, play that type of character. Did that give you ideas? Did that give you fuel for this character? Oh, definitely. Because um, I saw uh, it was not just lines. It was also she was making movements and gestures. Every aspect of filming, and this is only day one. We, at this point, don't know what our schedule will be from here on. But we look forward to working with you on this. We look forward to having you in class, and hopefully... This yep. won't be the last project you do. Yeah, awesome. Thanks Excellent. for having me. Not a problem. Right. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and step on out. Okay. Um, Kent, what is our time? 3.45, so i got a few more minutes. All right. You want to step in? And yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and bust in? you obviously got something to say. Well, I just want to apologize for anyone that's been watching that uh, about the intermittency of the uh, connection. I know it's dropped a few times throughout the broadcast, and it has? yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's been it's been kind of crazy trying to manage setting up lights and managing the computer and everything all at once. But uh, best laid plans. Yeah, and I, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen with the recording. I don't know if it saved them or what. I don't know what's well, going to happen with all of this mess. Did we ever today. even get the last show up on on Facebook yet? No, it's not up on okay. Facebook, but it's up on the Ustream, okay. you know. So. Well, possibly tomorrow we'll get that taken care of. We'll take a look at what this looks like and... Uh, Hopefully it saved the video clips at least, even though it lost internet connection. Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll have to find out later. Well, if not, 
if people out there have questions, you know, we as we've told everybody from directors to acting coaches to actors to people who really do just only come out to be an extra, um, call us. We are all available 24-7. We will all, I mean, this is what we do. This is what we want to do. Um, all the time. And we want to create projects that, you know, you, the actor, want to be a part of, that you, the cameraman, want to be a part of, that the editor wants to want, you know, things that I people just, want. I just like shooting. You know, if anyone says, hey, I need a camera somewhere, I'm always interested. Yes, <laughs> um, so much so. That for years it might have been to your own detriment. It, it probably was because I, I went and I shot a lot of things where I didn't get paid for them, and I've kind of stopped doing that. You know, someone's like, I, I went to an event the other day, and someone's like, Well, where's your camera? And I'm like, Well, I don't have it with me. Like, you always have your camera. And it's like, Well, I got to the point where I don't take my camera everywhere because if I'm out shooting something, people expect me to then edit it, and I don't have time to edit everything I shoot. You know, and and so. for the longest time, you have been the technical department. You're not just the editor. Anything to do with editing, anything to do with the website, anything to do with computers. I mean, I'm I'm not proud. I am technically retarded. I yep. do not understand. I do not have the patience. I am a creative mind, and I want to write and create stories. And like I told Spencer, sitting down in front of a computer, whether it's editing or working on a website. That's all tedium to me and it blocks my creative flow. So you have taken on, in the last three and a half years, you have taken on the weight of an entire city on your shoulders, um, most often for my benefit. And I just want to say, you know, I hope people are seeing this because in front of God and the world, I want to say thank you. Well, you know, I really like working with you. I appreciate So, I mean, uh, the first time we met, you know, I, I, well, we met briefly on in, in passing a couple of times, on, at the but the, yeah, the, but the first time we actually sat down and talked, uh, we had a meeting set up, and we went to, it was at the Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. This was in 2008? Yes, yes. Or was it was it 2008, or was it 2009 when you it got either, back it from... It was either the end of 7 or the beginning of 08. We came back from Oklahoma in... Oh, excuse me, August of 07. Yeah, so it, it, it was in 08. It was right before you went to Oklahoma. Okay. And I think it right was, it was, you know, it was when you got back from Oklahoma? Okay, I guess, yeah, it was when you got back from Oklahoma. I don't know. But uh, you know, we sat down and we talked because I, I, I was looking for somebody to, to work with because I was doing, I had my own production company and I was doing everything. I was doing light, sound, camera, edit doing everything you know I wasn't doing film I was base I was just basically doing events and uh, now you say you were just doing events but to be fair you were doing events you were doing concerts you were doing well, I consider concerts events you were doing interviews um, I'm trying to think of the body of work you did show me what else was there but you've done I mean weddings uh, Big events, small event, interviews, and since we've teamed together, you know, I, at the time we met, I was on a mad hunt for a cinematographer. Yep. I had attempted to work with several different people right. um, to several different levels of not success. I had started a film project called Words of the Father, Words of a Father, excuse me. I think it was three different times I'd started, yeah, three different times I'd started production on that film. And never got anywhere with it right. past day one or two, and and that was the first thing we did together. Right, and you and the way that happened is I remember uh, Misty invited you over mm -hmm. to the house, and we were sit there, and I was editing when you got there, and uh, you kind of came in and you saw what I was editing. It was it was a drag show, it, and you made a comment that that was not the that was not event videography or editing style that was more of a cinematic it's style it had a story in it and so you, you you just sat there and you looked at me and says do you want to shoot a movie i was like hell yeah and so uh, like uh, six weeks later we were shooting words of a father i think and that was a god that was one of the easiest things i'd ever done up to that point i i'd tell you i wanted a shot and the one that's the one that sticks out is madison avenue that that was in you went across the street you put your camera down, I came over and I said, one inch that way. Other than that, you had it perfect. 
and I didn't have to belabor the explanation. I gave you an idea of what I was looking for, and you set it up, and you had it the way I wanted it. And uh, yeah, and I think that's one reason I like working with you because uh, we kind of understand each other's creative minds. You, in um, in three or four words, you can portray something to me that I and I can pick up on it. The, there, there was one time we had there were what eight people in the room, and you said four words: "The bowl is clear," and I knew exactly what you wanted. And everyone else kind of looked at each other like, I said "The bowl was clear." You said, "Okay," and everybody else went, "Huh?" Not exactly, because you know. It was and like, we got a beautiful and, shot. And we got a fantastic shot. Uh, did we put that in your director's I room? The, I think it's in the director's room. I think it's in the director's room. room. Yeah. Yeah, because unfortunately that project never got finished, you know, because uh, our actor and lead actor and that had to, uh, our lead actor and lead actors both, both had to move. move. One went to Florida, one went to uh, Georgia. One went to Georgia so for we, a while. Yeah, so we, lo we lost both of them uh, three quarters of the way through production, which was really sad. It is, because there's a lot, I mean, it has its weak moments, but overall, there are a lot of really nice stylized shots, because we shot that very differently than anything else we've done. Oh yeah, and it, it was, I think the uh, trickiest thing we had to do was uh, that slow motion shot where the camera's going around the room and then it goes under the coffee table and back up and uh, and that looked smooth as it's, hell. I mean, that was, fantastic. that was, and you know, and it's, like, it's like how do you get a cam, you know, a shot to go to circle, circle the room and then go under the coffee table that's quite clearly in the shot and then back up and around and, and it was and it was a lot of fun. I, I do have to say I I have given you some challenges in shot ideas and been very very pleased on on well over ninety percent of the time with the results. Um, the happy hour trailer. That shot you had to do with Dan Reed at Westis. That took us four hours? Well, that, that shot in, in itself didn't take four hours. We shot, we, we were in Westies for four hours total. Oh, it was okay. Yeah, we were in Westies for four hours total. Uh, it was, it was, uh, we did three takes on that. The, fir the first time I was like, I didn't like that. The second time I made about quarter way through and I said, no, that ain't gonna work. Let's try that again. And the third time, I, I think I finally got it. I was shot that in slow motion, and right. we ended up having to speed it up to normal speed for the uh, final trailer because it just it, the slow motion was a little was a little too was slow. A little too slow. In the, in the end. So we had to speed that up, and there I did I did a had, I had fun with that shot. You know, that unfortunately has not really been uh, published. Where I did the entire shot where I I sped it up and then slowed it down so it changes speeds as the camera spins. And uh, I showed it to a few people and it made them sick, so it hasn't really been published. <laughs> Don't uh, mean and mean shots. Yeah, it, it really made them motion sick because, I mean, the camera's... Whoop, whoop. Yeah, it was fun. Blair Witch. All right, well, I know we're, uh, we're coming down to the wire here, and looks like Jamie's done a, a bit of setup and communicating. Um, we're still waiting on a few more people to show up. But if I have a moment, um, and you'll have to tell me the time, if I have a moment, I'd like to try and get Alexandra over here if she's willing. Uh, we have a few minutes. Okay. Let me see if Alexandra, I can. Alexandra, would you be willing to give me a few moments? Have a seat. Okay. And have a microphone. Oh, what are we doing? <laughs> um, just a quick, very, very low-key, quick conversation. Okay. Um, we're discussing how pretty much everybody in this film, but me, mm -hmm. because I've been with it from the start, has been beyond last minute. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was just two weeks ago that I sent you a message. If that. <laughs> if that. Um, and you have your voice now. That's, that's yes, I do. Uh, you were obviously Memphis sick, <laughs> and you were unable to even really communicate with us other than through the text. Mm -hmm. So. We contacted you two weeks ago, but you really haven't been able to really ask questions mm -hmm. or anything like that mm -hmm. to any great length, at least not to me, and I don't know that you've talked much with Jamie because mm -hmm. of the illness. Mm -hmm. So what is it like to just jump in? Here's a character, do it. It's incredibly easy for me because 
I can easily jump into a character. Just give me a few lines, give me atmosphere, and I'm like, all right, I'm in, done, let's do it. Excellent. So you're the kind of actress that the minute those lights kick on, the minute that camera kicks on, you're on. Challenge accepted. Nice. I like the sound of that. No nerves? <laughs> no. No nerves so, at all. So, now, we've only met once, briefly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, had you actually talked to Jamie before walking in here today? Um, not really. The first time I really spoke to him was when you gave him the phone, because I couldn't talk. Right. <laughs> so, you know, brief as it has been, mm -hmm. what is your impression coming into this? Reminds me when I was in high school. I used to I used to dress like this all the time. <laughs> so I, re I remember wearing a shirt every single week. I would have it washed. It would say, "My cat can beat up your cat." Nice, <laughs> nice. Now I, I of course I reached out to you because mm -hmm. I know you've done modeling. Yes. So you're comfortable in front of the camera. Yes, I am. You are comfortable and you understand your body, mm -hmm. much like our lead lady who is a, a belly dancer. Mm -hmm. And of course, how how can I deny? A woman that will dress up as Catwoman as often as I see. <laughs> um, I grew up on comic books. Mm -hmm. Jamie's got Spider Man and Batman tattoos on his body. <laughs> he hasn't seen the pictures, has he? So th this was kind of a perfect match for us. Mm -hmm. um, do you have concerns or questions regarding your character, or do you really have a grip on what you're doing? Um, honestly, my concern on the way here was crap, I do not have fangs. <laughs> That was it. Not necessary. Okay. Um, one of the things about this film is our vampires aren't really the stereotype. Yes. Uh, obviously, they're not going to be the, the glittery Twilight type. Oh, vampire. thank God. Um, your character in this script is much more enigmatic. Mm -hmm. you're, you're much more of an image mm -hmm. and an impression than fangs. Okay. Um, and then Robert, the, the your victim, mm -hmm throughout the course of the film is becoming the vampire. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of weakness. It's, we're, we're treating it like uh, DTs, mm -hmm. like a, dr uh, a drug addict going through withdrawals, not yes. getting what he needs as he goes through this becoming process. Mm -hmm. So our vampires are going to have a very old school mm -hmm. kind, of a, kind of a take on them, much more so than what we're seeing in the film now. Okay. Um, my question's been answered, actually. I, I kind of continued my sentence, but you kind of <laughs> answered it with your reaction. <laughs> which I was going to say, you know, what are your feelings towards that? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you much more Nosferatu of the silent era or Twilight? I cannot stand Twilight for stars. I like my vampires to explode in the sunlight and give interviews. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> However, my brother actually has a picture of Nosferatu hanging like above his bed. So I can't walk into his room without telling that thing is watching my every move. I was, I've always been scared of Nosferatu, which is great because vampires are supposed to be sexy and terrifying. Right. And that is actually one of the things that my partner has mm -hmm. emphasized. Mm -hmm. He's like, when we do these rewrites, mm -hmm. um, one of the things we're going to do is your character is mm -hmm. have more space in it. Yes. Um, in, in the version that exists now, which will be garbaged, mm -hmm. she comes in in the beginning. She makes a victim out of Robert. And we don't see her again till the end. Okay. And, you know, Jamie and I sat and talked, and we felt that that really took away a lot of potential conflict. Mm -hmm. We kind of like the idea of Zephyr's just puppet mastering, mm -hmm. being manipulated. And she is the one, ultimately, that is in control of all of this. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be something we kind of bring to the character as we go through the rewrites. Okay. So I think we're, we're winding down. Okay, well, we're gonna, we'll, we'll wind down because I know Jamie's anxious to get going and, and we want to get some of this stuff out of the way. Okay. Um, I want to thank you for being a part of this. Sure. Thank you, especially, especially on such short notice. <laughs> um, I'd love to invite you to come to our, our acting classes on Monday nights. This mm -hmm. is where we have them. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that as we move forward and are scheduling the rest of the mm -hmm. trailer shoot, mm -hmm we'll get a chance to know each other a little bit better and maybe we'll do some other projects together as well. Can't wait. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And we'll look forward to working with you. <laughs> All right. That's going to end the show for the night for the day. We will be back next week with hopefully Sam Bear is supposed to be our guest and he'll be discussing his film I Shot Your Death or I Filmed Your Death, excuse me. Um, and for myself
for Matt Martin, for any other Twin Peaks fans that might be out there. Sam Bear had the foresight and fortune to be able to work with Michael Horse, uh, the gentleman that played Deputy Hawk on the Twilight, uh, excuse me, on the Twin Peaks TV series. <laughs> so we'll have a few questions for him about that. As a Twin Peaks fan, I will probably have many questions about Mr. Horse himself. Uh, join us next week, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. right here on In Frame, and soon we will have this episode and last week's episode on the Facebook page for you to peruse at your leisure. Thank you very much.